And the Sergeant Major makes a great point of the fact that the Army wasn't just sitting there doing nothing while this transformation was going on. There were soldiers and NCOs out and officers out there every day doing operations around the world. If you remember the 90s, the op tempo was fantastic. We, we couldn't just sit back and look to the future. We had to you know, fend off the fires today, and at the center of it all was the soldier doing his duty as change occurred around him in a very different Army. Dr. James Carafano. I, I'm going to be really brief, but I'm really excited. Unlike most things that I get asked to comment on, I actually know something about this topic. So, um, you know, I, I actually observe this, this Army from, from many, many different perspectives. And, and I might quibble with the, the framework of John's book and argue if, if, if generations from now people will really look back at this and really think transformation was really the operative paragon. I, I would actually say that this, to me, is an object lesson on how to live through troubled times. Uh, because now reflecting back, you know, the, the, the Army could have been in much, 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 much worse shape in 2001 than it was. And a lot of it was, be, because it wasn't, was because of what was done in that very Im important year between about 89 and 99. So I went th through John's book and I pulled out for me kind of the, the five pearls of, of um, the real, I think, the real things that I thought were really, really uh, dynamically important about understanding about how to lead an army through troubled times. And it does actually create an acronym. It's, it's E-H-F-G-A. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just go, I'll we'll be really, really brief. So first of all, the, the, the first one is experimental forces. Actually, the first project I ever worked at when I came to the Center of Military History was the history of the Army's experimental forces. And the, and the, and the, the one truism of all of them is as soon as the, 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 the crisis was over and began a downside, we dismantled the, uh, the experimental force to save some force structure. Big mistake. Um, experimental forces were key to the success of the 90s, uh, and the biggest mistake the Army could make today is as they look to the future, if the first thing they jettisoned was an experimental force capability. So that is the one thing I would not let go of. Um, the second one is, is really homeland defense. One of the great lessons of the 1990s and in through 9-11 and the post-9-11 era was the importance of the Army to their traditional mission of civil support to the homeland, of defense of the homeland, uh, it was a critical need, and as we grow to a population, 330 million plus now, country the size of a continent, infrastructure which is incredibly robust and yet in many ways terribly fragile, to lose the sense of focus on a homeland defense mission, I believe would be tragic, and I believe that would also be the first thing thrown over the bus as uh, people look to downsize. Um, the third one is futures forecasting. And I can't impress on this one enough, uh, um, the l l land maneuvers, uh, the Army after next. These kinds of exercises are absolutely critical. Look, look, there is no narrative that the Army can paint that can keep it from getting whacked by an idiotic Congress. There is no <laughs> argument that you can make to, to save force structure. I mean, that you, but what you can do is plan for the future. And the most important thing to plan for the future is futures forecasting. Those efforts are absolutely vital, and they're more complex than ever because today you really are looking at demographics that will be dramatically different 10 or 15 years down the road, industrial bases that might be dramatically different 10 or 15 years down the road. And it's not just to do these exercises. They have to be tied in to the most senior leadership in the service, and that has to be part of their thinking about what things they really are going to embed and nurse in the future. So um, that to me is vitally important. Um, the number fourth one is contracting and combat. Uh, the first time I ever heard about this was actually at an AUSA convention. It was the year after Desert Storm, and there was actually a panel on, hey, this contracting thing, we might should give some attention to this because we might have to do this in a serious way sometime. And, of course, we really didn't. Um, you know, contracting is not going to go away. The, the, the private sector, in terms of its capabilities and what it can deliver, is growing and changing. The, you know, the, the answer is not insourcing. There's going to be vast interaction with the private sector in the future, and contracting is a fundamental, in my mind, in a free society, the ability to contract for services is one of the most powerful capabilities, combat multipliers you can have. So don't pretend that that's not going to happen again. And the last one is really, I believe, is the most important, and I'm so honored to sit next to the Sergeant Major, and that was um, the, the importance of values. And what people forget, uh, and to me as a historian not, and as a serving officer, was dramatically important is, you know, in the 1960s, we, you know, the, the, the Army was widely trashed as a service that had lost its way, had lost its values, and nobody could ever explain to me how the junior officers of the 1960s became these senior officers in the 1990s and, did all these, and, ma and made all these incredible accomplishments. And the answer is, is because they did have values. And, and, and by the time we got to 1973, that was about all they had left. And those values were instrumental in saving the Army and rebuilding it 
Uh, they were instrumental in the 90s in many situations when there were distractions, uh, some of them not pleasant, like uh, Aberdeen and, and some other things. And uh, time and time again, I watched senior leaders of the Army go back to values and use that as a thread to pull things through. And there is no question in my mind that regardless of what happens in budget or TOA or whether a program comes or disappears or whatever, if the Army loses its focus on values, it will cease to be a helpful Army to the nation. And if it never loses that, regardless of what happens to the budget, regardless of the mission ends, it is going to be a force that's going to serve this nation well. So thanks, John, for an incredibly valuable and informative book. Thanks. All right, we have some time for some questions, and I uh, look forward to them. And uh, if you'd please identify yourself, and uh, General Sullivan, you're first. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, this is a world-class book. I, uh, it's really worth reading. It's heavy. It can be heavy going. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of detail in there that, frankly, I didn't even know existed until I read the book. Uh, it's very well documented, and this will be a source for a lot of people for years to come. Uh, one thing about uh, this business about revolution and military affairs, I didn't use it, I'll be perfectly candid with all of you. I thought it was an assertion that was made, and I wasn't signing up because I wasn't, uh, I didn't have enough ego to think that what we were doing at that time was, a, was revolutionary. It seemed to be the way to go. It was the right thing to do to give the Army uh, the flexibility to do whatever it would be asked to do, and it would come, in my view, from the ability to move information around very quickly so that the commanders would, in fact, know what was really going on in front of them. And uh, I, I, to this day, do not know whether that is a legitimate term, the revolution in military affairs. And I don't think that this, this what started here, will be over for the rest of this century, because there are people inventing things. I seem to have lost my iPhone somewhere <laughs> in the... In the uh, Ray here this morning, but uh, they keep inventing it, and this is moving at the speed of light. And the question is, can the Army keep up with it and continue this experimentation? Because it will change organizations in profound ways. First role of a commander, just remember, is to keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. And that, to the Sergeant Major's point, is exactly what a lot of this was about, keeping hope alive in the troops who were being ripped apart by this budget stuff. And don't talk about that. Talk about a bright future. Now, it wasn't bright, because we wound up fighting for 10 years, and we took a lot of casualties, and we made a lot of sacrifice. But I'm happy to say I was a part of this Army, uh, and in some small way, a part of this. And I'm proud of it. And I don't care who knows it. <laughs> I am very proud of being a part of the Army and what the Army has done over the years. Thanks to all of you for coming. John, you're terrific. This is a terrific book. And uh, I appreciate the comments of all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Right, uh, for those with questions, which, if you'd stand up and identify yourselves and uh, either direct your question to the panel member or members that you wish, and uh, we'll go from there. Who's first? Comments? Questions? Please. Sidney Friedberg, learning from veterans, and I know about half the panel, uh, Dr. Carafano, Dr. General Hortzog, and I've had the pleasure to talk on, on occasion. Uh, if I sort of pull out the lesson here, make it explicit, it's that you can't just go into a defensive crouch when the downsizing knives are out. You actually have to have a positive vision of something you're going to fight for, not something you're trying to prevent. So, A, you know, if people agree that that's kind of the historical lesson for the Army's institution, what, anybody have a guess what that needs to be for the next uh, 10, 20 years of, uh, of difficult times. Anyone? Uh, I think you've exactly captured General Sullivan's sentiment uh, as he stood up the Lamb Task Force. Uh, that, that idea was 
don't sit around feeling sorry for yourself because we're going through the perturbation of downsizing. Have a vision. Uh, he took the time to develop a vision. Uh, the project was the LAM Task Force, and there was a uh, about a two-year process of uh, interwoven directorates of uh, general officer council meetings of, uh, you know, a, a, a elaborate um, efforts to get the entire army thinking about the future. Uh, I'm not sure that I could lay out for you what vision would both engage the Army and make it happy now, but I think a comparable process to what the LAM Task Force undertook and, and, and attempted to achieve, the process itself of envisioning the future, of debating the future, of talking about what comes next, of uh, uh, talking about changes in doctrine or organization, I, I think that is uh, a, a therapeutic process for the service to go through. And, and if the budget knives are out, uh, and, and if we're, uh, our, our back's a bit against the wall, if downsizing is inevitable, uh, it's a good time to envision how we're going to come out of that crisis, but also what we're going to look like at the far end. Uh, I offered up robotics as being a, a, a paradigm that we need to get our heads around. Uh, I'm sure there are others. I think also if you listen to uh, or get uh, the transcript of what the chief talked, the current chief talked about yesterday at the Eisenhower luncheon, he he laid out some very specific points of things that he's looking at, that the army's looking at, and uh, to get to the way ahead. So I don't think we're just because we reached the end of the 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 service of the people in the book, I don't think we're floundering in the dark as to what's next. I think as General Dempsey did a lot uh, when he was chief on the way ahead. I think the current chief has done a lot of thinking on the way ahead. And I, I think it's, I think he, he hit those points pretty hard yesterday in his speech. I don't want to go back over and I've miss, missed some of them, but I'm sure that transcript is out there for all of us to reread. Huh? If you didn't get that, just go to the AUSA.org, and it's there. Let me add a thought or two on that business. Um, the technique that started the, with the LAM Task Force was to get a small group of folks together. One of the most difficult things to do in thinking of a future is to do something when the paper's blank. Uh, a lot of us can grade papers, but to do something when the paper's blank and all you have is uh, peripheral environmental conditions, no money, uh, go anywhere, do anything, et cetera. You've got to get at uh, creating a, a vision. Uh, General um, Sullivan's technique for that uh, was to uh, share the burden with his TRADOC commander uh, before me, which was uh, General Freddie Franks, and they put a small group together with General Tommy Franks, then Brigadier General, and their mission was to do the following, and I was there, I was part of that when General Sullivan said, the way ahead is to take your mind to a mountaintop uh, 20 years in the future. Uh, study it. Try to figure out what you see from that mountaintop. And this is an aphorism, but you really, I watched these folks do that. And then uh, once you figure out what the key things might be, information, lightness, agility, power, etc. then walk that back to where you are. Now, the, the, the uh, difficulties with that is that you may stand on the mountaintop mentally and see nothing. You may be on the wrong mountaintop and the things you see don't come to pass. I can guarantee you that I didn't see uh, this last 10 years when I was a TRADOC commander. Um, but I watched this technique occur. What came out of that process was a small pamphlet. Uh, I did add some number, 505-something, I can't remember the number. But it was what the future might be like. And then we set about uh, an experimental period where you took each of these things and built hypotheses and tried to figure out whether they were real or not. I don't know who the small group of folks are, but they can't be, you can't necessarily put that on the Department of Army staff because they have to operate the Army on a daily basis. And they may not have, this is going to sound funny, but they may not have the time to focus on that kind of a, a futuristic look. 
I suspect that uh, when General Dempsey did that, and he did something very similar to that, his vision was that we needed to work at the very lowest levels of the Army, the squad, the team, etc., and to try to do something that would make quantum leaps in the lethality and survivability at that level. I know that he and General Odierno have talked in, in length about it, and General Odierno's had the job for a month. It's unreasonable to expect him to have all of the answers or a total vision, but he will have. I don't know what it'll be. Uh, hopefully, it will be something that is as important to the force of the future as, as an example, the national training centers or the combat training centers were to this generation. It's my judgment that that might be one of the most important things that occurred in the 40 years I've been working in the, the military arena. Uh, I think John has, it, has one of the things, a robotic uh, vision might be right. It may be time for a new training regime or a rebucking of the old training regime. Those are the ideas that might come out of this. But if you see a small group that's put to work on this, um, that probably is the start point. You can't do it in a hugely democratic uh, process. It has to start with a few people that are comfortable working on blank sheets of paper. So I, you know, I, I can't really say I'm always a fan of the vision thing. I, I mean, there's a time when that's appropriate, but you know, anybody can have a vision. You, know, you get infinite number of monkeys typing infinite number of visions. Somebody's going to craft the perfect vision. Just you know, um, you know, particularly when you're in an era when, when you have uncertain or unclear resources, you, you know, the notion, you know, visions are used to drive strategic change in a certain direction. And when you have almost very little control over what you're doing, vision may not actually be the most helpful thing. So the, the value of futures forecasting is, and I think a lot of people misperceive this, is futures forecasting is not about predicting the future. That's why it's called forecasting and not futures predicting, right? So the notion of futures forecasting is to predict the range of possible futures and then to think about how you might respond to them. And you might have many different scenarios. I mean, we could turn around in two years and see an army that's not getting smaller, but an army that's getting bigger. We could see a dramatic reversal in defense investments. I mean, what are we going to do then, right? So, you know, the conversations we're having now about, you know, how are we going to downsize might be totally irrelevant. The question would be, how are you going to build that back and how fast are you going to do that? So I, I do, um, you know, there's always this pension in, in the, among the services to, that the, the need to, to defend themselves and to protect themselves by crafting a um, uh, why, what's my purpose and what am I going to do? And, and then often that translates into having to craft a future that, that suits justifying what you want to do, right? And, and those rarely ever are actually terribly effective at driving the debates in terms of what your TOA actually is. And, and the virtue, I think, of what the Army did in the 1990s is, you know, come on, the Army didn't win any debates. I mean, the, I mean we, they, they did a great job. And I think the point about the QDR is actually absolutely spot on. The Army did a great job not getting completely hammered in the QDRs. Um, but but the, every, almost every virtuous thing that happened to the Army in the 1990s that had enabled it to respond and recover and, and meet strategic needs in the, in the 21st century because of, were the things that the Army did internally on very limited or, or very scarce resources. And it, it really wasn't at all about their ability to go to the hill or change big minds or change the defense strategy or everything else. Almost everything they did was internal. And actually, I, I mean, John can correct me on this, but I think if you look back at a lot of great interwar armies where um, really great seed cordon was laid, it was not done because the service went out and got a sponsor or a mentor or carved out some share. It's just that they did something in Hyde that, that turned out to be very useful down the road. Is that fair? Yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that uh, on very limited means, uh, a relatively uh, select group of folks envisioned a future that, uh, that, 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 was, that they could put into practice when funded. And I think that was uh, a, a point, and it corresponds with yours is that uh, you, you, know, you work the project and out of hide you get the prototypical units and you have this experimental force and you, you, you make it work on very slender resources until all of a sudden this uh, unanticipated uh, future comes and you've got the money to, make, to bring it to fruition. So I guess that's a short way of thinking. I, I say I agree with okay. you. <laughs> yes, Eric. Yeah. Uh, Eric Villard from the U.S. Army Center of Military History. General Brown, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you. Uh, this question or comment comes from my uh, very brief but uh, 
uh, valuable experience I had in Afghanistan. I went over in March of 2010 mm -hmm. to spend a few weeks with the uh, five two strikers. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that uh, struck me, being with soldiers and running around with the striker vehicles, uh, was the profusion of technologies. You know, you had the FPCB2 and the BFT and the land forced. Uh, and all these monitors within the vehicle, and half the time they just switch them off, like, oh, we, we, we can't deal with that. Or they would have overlapping functions. Um, often there'd be a lot of, um, uh, there'd be a tremendous need for a relatively simple thing like uh, face recognition. I mean, I, they had these um, very expensive pieces of equipment to take pictures of the villagers and put them on a database. And I'm thinking, pull out the iPhone. Take a picture, you know, mm -hmm. there you go, upload it. Um, so my question is this, the procurement process, do you have, I see you groaning here, uh, thoughts on this? Because if we are going to be a leaner, more agile force, how do we um, wrap our heads around that and deal with the, with the issue of fielding the right equipment, and not only the right equipment, but at a faster pace, being, having the agility to sometimes reach off the shelf or kill a program that isn't working and say, hey, some, we've got something in the private sector that might work better right now. Let's just suck it up and, and take that instead of something we've been working on for three years. Yeah. Yeah, let, me, let me take a shot at that because I was involved in that particular venture. Um, the word that's germane to that argument is network. To have a network, you have to have um, uh, capabilities to share information. Um, when we originally started this tranche of this, and again, I, I very humbly realize that I'm just one person in a period of time in a very long process. Uh, but the 4th of the 9th Infantry, the Manchus, about a year ago, uh, got a a stack of equipment that was to provide them um, a role for the individual soldier to enter any network. It was originally titled Land Warrior back in the mid-90s in this period of time. Uh, it later became uh, uh, Net Warrior, uh, named for my first battalion commander, uh, Colonel Net. Um, Medal of Honor winner. I happen to have the right name, I guess. But the, the problem is this. Any, any set of equipment, even if you experiment with it and you test it and it seems to have promise, when you give it to a, a unit that's headed to war, you have to give them time to learn two things. One, how to use the equipment and to tailor it because it'll never look exactly like what you thought it was going to look like. And second, then, to uh, practice or, or train as a unit that has that equipment, because having that equipment and having it work makes you do different kinds of things. The Manchus had six months to digest that and put it together. I went to Fort Lewis in the first month of that, along with the TRADOC commander at that time, and I heard uh, Sergeant First Class, uh, who had had it for maybe two weeks, stand up and say, it's the worst stuff I've ever seen. I'll never use it. It's a going into a footlock or the hell with it. That's a rough quote. Uh, <laughs> he took all of that stuff another three or four months, trained with it. Uh, the commander of the unit decided he wanted to take it to Iraq, as it turned out. They took it to Iraq and worked with it for about two months or three months, and then I talked to 14 NCOs and officers who, was, who were involved with it, and they were great fans of it. But it wasn't the kit that they were issued initially. It was their version of it. They had, after three or four months of combat, joined the experimental process, threw it all on a table, said, we don't need this, I've never used that, but this is great stuff, and this is, this is terrific. So I learned that lesson. 5-2 that you went to see got it issued to them sort of as they got off the gangplank. Mm -hmm. Never had the training that was correct for it, and consequently didn't value it, didn't know quite how to use it, and nor had their unit uh, matriculated with it as a part of it. Now, your second half of that, that's the history. The second half of your question was, 
How do you get something that a soldier needs rapidly into the hands of the soldier? There have been a number of programs throughout history where we tried to do that. One was called an Operational Needs Statement, an ONS. Mm -hmm. um, as a commander year, uh, many years ago, uh, I was in a place where people were throwing grenades into the back of deuce and a half trucks and wounding people. And the best thing that uh, our troops could come up with was how about a Kevlar cover so it would bounce off and even if it exploded would deflect. Uh, I asked for it, I wrote the ON statement. It goes to the G3 of the Army at the time. And within a week or two, I got a hundred of these things cut to, I mean, exact, exactly what you needed. In that, this 10 years, what's happened to that is that instead of being one or two things that you can write a letter to the G3 and get an immediate response from industry on, the system is so constipated that there's four or 5,000 of these on his desk. I asked a sort of tongue-in-cheek to one of the G3s, how do you prioritize these things? And he said, I start with the ones that are signed by a three-star general. <laughs> I said, that's probably just bass backwards. What you want to do is start with the ones that are written by a, a PFC, because that's what it was initially intended to do, to work at that level. Uh, this is not, uh, this quick breakthrough, rapid acquisition, uh, we've done it with rapid acquisition or REFs, uh, rapid uh, employment, uh, we've done it with, uh, tried to do it with, uh, with pots of money that the chief of staff of the Army could expend without asking Mother May I by six levels or on the hill or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, none have been hugely terminally successful. It's an alive and well issue today. The current Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, went through all these 4,000 things and decided what he needed to do was to prioritize, since we didn't get it prioritized any other way, he selected 72 out of the 4,000. There were things that he thought and he and his staff thought had to do specifically with saving lives on today's battlefield. Not future developments, but today. What is it I can do? And he's working his way through those 72 to try to make that, that happen. Um, now. It's been uh, half a century since I was a private, so I'm going to answer this next one as probably more as a general than a private, and you're not going to like this, but I believe it. Um, what PFC Snerdlap wants, PFC Hartzog, never made it to PFC, but private Hartzog, <laughs> uh, may not always be a useful thing. Right now, Every soldier would love to have a iPod or iPhone-like thing, but we haven't quite gotten to the point where they can network effectively. And so I think we've got a little work to do on that. The Army, uh, the vice, current Vice Chief of Staff of the Army is convinced that rather than an exotic flip down monocle, TV on the rifle, all kinds of stuff. What he really needs is a pretty effective iPhone kind of thing. <coughs> and so I, I believe that's where we're headed. And uh, I think that um, as we go there, we're all together um, at all levels are gonna have to understand how to use that so that we don't lose its goodness by getting too exotic on what we think it'll give us. I also have one other memory. I'm sorry, but I got to share this with you. As we were doing all this stuff at Hood back in the 90s, and we invented uh, FPCB2 and, and turned into Blue Force Tracker and other things, we had a whole motor park there that we were bringing thousands of vehicles in and appliquing all this new stuff in there to, to try it, prototype it. I was walking through there one day, and uh, I heard this country music coming out of a tank. And so I went up and crawled up on the tank and looked in, and they had taken the FBCB2 and turned it into something that approximated a radio, and he was listening to what he wanted to listen to and not what I put it there for. <laughs> so you, you really have to kind of Be watch all of that. Does that help? I mean, oh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I, and some of this, too, it seems to be if, if, if this whole, I was one of these guys, is I'd like to send money to, to Toys R Us and get a bunch of those remotely piloted planes. It doesn't have yeah. a camera. Taliban don't know that. 
they just hear it buzzing around at night. So that that alone, I mean, for two, you know, 200 bucks, might be an effective thing. So it's like ideas. My question was, how do ideas from that level percolate up? And then come back and everyone was an impression, oh, I've got the best idea in the world, but no one cares. So I'm not even going to bring it up. I, I'm sure it's a common kind of feeling. Well, right? you've got to have the right people in the right places that are open-minded enough to accept and seek and, and look for those ideas, too. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question. If I did, I would have implemented it a long time ago. <laughs> I think uh, the uh, with respect to the the rapid procurement or overcoming obstacles in, in the procurement process, it kind of depends on what the item is. Uh, a lot of things can be off the shelf, and when you're talking about some of the technologies you were describing, there are civilian counterparts uh, that, that uh, are advancing quickly because of the fact that there's a civilian market for them, and because of that, uh, they become good ideas for just what we call off-the-shelf procurement. And so that's where your idea of drawing the idea from the guy at the bottom uh, is uh, very rich. Uh, there's also stuff that instead of um, uh, getting it off the shelf, what it really does is provides a surface that can be contracted for or outsourced. And I'm going to defer to Jay Carafano because he wrote the book on that and uh, you know, let him uh, cover that genre. But you have some items that have no civilian use, you know, and for those, there's no substitute for the operational need statement followed by the process of experimentation, followed by, uh, you know, the user testing. Uh, and, and so uh, hopefully uh, there's no civilian use for a rail gun. You know, I mean, uh, you know, or electromagnetic, uh, you know, building destructor. Hopefully, uh, you know, there's no but civilian use anticipated. But for those kinds of things, uh, you know, you, you have to go through a procurement process and you can, um, you can thin it out. Uh, you can try to uh, uh, achieve efficiencies with respect to it. Uh, but the only way you can make it work is with a effective alliance with industry in such a manner that you've got the spiral development that lets you bounce back and forth between the military and the industrial sector until you've got a product that works and that you're willing to buy, recognizing that there's no commercial market to propel it along. I, I just can't believe, reflecting on what General Hartzog said, which I thought was an enormously important comment, which is what you're really talking about is not acquisition at all. What you're talking about is combat innovation, which is different, right? And, and, and as General Hartzog pointed out, which often gets forgotten, is it's not just about getting the thing. It's the training, the doctoring, the sustainment, and all the other, and including the test of action, all those other pieces, right? And if you don't look at it in that holistic manner, you're not going to have successful combat mm -hmm. innovation. But and my great frustration with, with the Army is, is the, the Army always learns this lesson in war. We get to war, and we figure out we have to do combat innovation, and then we, we ad hoc the processes to create combat innovation. And then what happens is when the war is over, we throw those away, and then we ad hoc again. And the irony is, is, is ad hocing in combat innovation is not ad hoc. It always happens. It's mandatory. You're always going to do it, regardless of how perfect you think you are. And the irony is, is well, you, know, it's, you should institutionalize innovation, which I know sounds very Orwellian. But, um, but, but that's the reality. Is if you want to be better at the combat innovation at the front end, then you have to have a combat innovation process available on day one of the war, not build it up over nine years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I could throw in one comment on the sustainment part, uh, unless something is completely expendable, every time you buy something off the shelf, don't forget that there are lots and lots of spare parts needed. And when, you, when you go out and buy you know, 50 gators and say, this will end our, all of our problems with moving around an airfield, remember that they're going to break down eventually, and you'll need tools, spare parts, uh, equipment, mechanics, uh, training mechanics through the Army school system. It's, it's a never-ending thing unless they're expendable. Uh, sir. I have a question that was caused uh, by a discussion I had with Sergeant Major of the Army Hall. Oh. Should you add a chapter or oh. should you write a new book on leader development over this period of time, particularly development on NCOES. I grabbed the book which I had read ahead of time and I quickly did the general Max Sermon read going to the index and I 
I saw very little on that. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is. John, you want to check with Mrs. first before you answer the question? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm with you. Should write another book. No, no, no. I was going to come out very quickly with we should write another book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think the, uh, I think that's a, a great topic. It's embedded here, and in particular, I, I make comments on the role of the non-commissioned officer educational system, the, the extent to which that has played in allowing the professionalization of the non-commissioned officer for the purposes that... Um, uh, for the purposes of, of, of bringing the technology to optimal use because only the NCO really has its hands on the technology uh, year after year in a way that uh, officers tend not to, uh, you know. And so uh, I do mention it, but I do think that the leadership is such a, uh, and leadership development is such a, uh, a, a broadly uh, conceptualized, and a uh, significant topic that it deserves a book of its own. And so, Richard, I, I think there's a, uh, you know, it, you lay out the contract and we'll see who competes for it. Yeah. This is not going to get you out of Operation Barbarossa. <laughs> <laughs> but you were going to say, were you going to say something to me? I think it deserves a new book. I really do. Bill. Having not... Uh, uh, this is Bill Epley of uh, the Center of Military History, and I haven't had a chance to read the, uh, the book yet, and, uh, and I, I hope to hopefully uh, right after this uh, meeting. But I wondered, uh, you know, and General Sullivan was here, I, I, and one of his themes when he was the chief of staff was no more task force Smiths mm -hmm. when we were downsizing the Army. And, and, and in a sense, he was measuring a level of effectiveness. And then mm -hmm. so... My question is, uh, and really broadly to the panel, uh, when you define, and when you have the Army transformation during this time period, have you correlated it or demonstrated that this has led to uh, an increased effectiveness on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan by less casualties, less time, I don't know <laughs> whether you can uh, say uh, success in the operation, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and if you have addressed it in the book, uh, uh, what factors did you think about on that? Yeah. So, Sure. Uh, well, Bill, of course, that's a, uh, a huge span of ground to go across. Um, the no more, ta no, more task force, no more task force Smiths uh, imperative uh, was specifically focused on the downsizing and, and to make sure that as we downsized we didn't lose everything and that the units we left with were of high quality capable and ready to go. Uh, the transformation was to take those units and to make them, although already effective, even more effective by harnessing the information age technologies and, and, and developing expeditionary capabilities. Uh, in the book, uh, in chapter nine, what I do basically is compare the army of Desert Storm and that era with the army of Iraqi freedom in that era. And in the conventional battlefield, uh, you know, on the battlefield that was fought uh, in, in which forces were attempting to contest ground, hold ground, seize ground, uh, the Army had, in fact, experienced a quantum leap in its effectiveness, and that was demonstrated uh, with the casualties, with the casualties inflicted, with the ground taken, with the number of uh, you know, you know, it, units um, uh, that were successful, but, but perhaps more than anything else, with the confidence of maneuver uh, in Desert Storm because of the concern for fratricide and because of the fact that you had weapons that could hit targets at much greater ranges than you could identify your, your target, uh, you ended up with very um, lockstep uh, uh, maneuver. You were trying very hard to keep on line to make sure nobody got off of line and got in front of you. Uh, in Iraqi Freedom, uh, on one day, you had five brigades conduct uh, different brigade size attacks going in different directions with, uh, you know, uh, envelopments and pirouettes and uh, battalions that were off on their own, uh, you know, uh, working the landscape. Uh, the, the tactics were much more fluid because everybody was confident that they knew where they were. 
so the measurement for conventional warfare was pretty obvious. Uh, for the unconventional warfare, for the shift to an insurgency, in that same chapter, I go into considerable length to describe the advantages that were conferred uh, by the advances that transformation had represented. But to a certain extent, in that, I ended up kind of trying to prove a negative because what I was doing was basically arguing that if it hadn't been for all these capabilities, the situation would have been so, so much worse. I believe that's true, but it's a less, you know, satisfying argument than having Desert Storm and Iraqi freedom as conventional operations and comparing them. The closest comparison I could make was the Russians in Afghanistan and Chechnya who were operating with an army that essentially had the technical and, uh, you know, organizational capabilities of our Desert Storm Army, uh, as opposed to uh, our army in uh, Iraqi freedom that had continued to advance and continued to progress and uh, under the same circumstances suffered far few casualties and accomplished a lot more. Uh, you know, from the beginning, the debate over uh, Iraq and Afghanistan has always been whether or not we invested the troops that were appropriate to the task at hand. Uh, and uh, I believe we did not, but I believe the, the transformation of the Army made our forces so much more effective than they had been that it came out a lot better than it might have. Well, let, me, let me add 10 seconds. Uh, mm. One of the toughest things in experimentation uh, one of the toughest challenges is to get the right metrics to so that you can do any kind of a comparison on proficiencies. And uh, in the 90s, as we were doing these major prototypical experimentation things, the best we were ever able to understand how to do was to create a hypothesis that if you did all of these things, you would increase the uh, amount of territory that you could influence, uh, get to anticip anticipatory logistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then to build the subsets of what you thought would reflect yes or no answers in those things. Uh, I guess what I learned out of all of that is that the enemy always has a vote. The uh, case, uh, the environment for the case can never be held constant. So subjectivity is a, is a uh, must. You can't get to uh, A versus B versus C in an answer. And the more, the higher you go in the total force, the more complex the metrics are. Um, it's just something I've found that at least during the experimentation, you had to fight at every day to try to make it as explicit as you possibly could for the conditions that you found in that day. Some, some of the uh, sort of embedded in the transformation is full-spectrum full operations. Just one anecdotal uh, example of uh, are we executing full-spectrum operations is I remember a picture in the New York Times with two certain first classes and a captain in, with the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan on horseback with wooden saddles with, with the technology to talk to the United States Army and the United States Air Force. So I, you know, I just anecdotally, I think you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you certainly progressed in that area. Mm -hmm. and, and there's many others uh, very similar to that. I, I think there's an assumption that, you know, we are more effective uh, and with the transformation. Um, I, I think the, the question as we move forward to show that effectiveness, that increase in effectiveness to uh, Congress, mm -hmm. to, uh, to show them that, hey, you know, this was worth the investment in terms of American lives mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, our, and the mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's why I ask the question, uh, mm -hmm. is it correlated somehow to a measure that you can demonstrate? And you, you've actually partially answered that. By yeah. Yeah, read chapter nine and come back to me, Bill. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you, sir. John McInerney, Retired Reserve. It seems that every time we take a step forward, we get what we paid for, we get the additional capability, but we also get at least three other things. We get a logistical industrial tail, which we then have to maintain. We have new skills that our guys have to learn, on top of what they learned before. They don't, they're not able to forget that. And we acquire a new vulnerability. I mean, when we went mechanized, we had huge mechanical parts. Everybody had to be a mechanic. And you had a big target that was painted on everyone's sensors. Now that we've gone digital, there's never enough AA batteries. We've got all the electronic supply chain stuff. Everybody's got to be kind of a techie. And suddenly, we're much more vulnerable to hacking, to cyber warfare. You look at your Blue Force tracker, and you trust it. But what happens if the enemy finds a way to feed it false information? So I'm not sure what you can do about these things. I'm just asking, is this of concern that we've taken a step forward, but we've also given ourselves additional baggage to carry and additional vulnerabilities in the field? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good question. And in, in Chapter 10, I try to come to grips with it uh, in, in a discussion of vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and you know, there were certain decisions that we have made or commitments that we've made that have caused us to be uh, exposed, and, and obviously we're very dependent upon bandwidth. We're very dependent on connections to satellites. You know, and knowing those vulnerabilities, uh, you, you, you have to take active steps to protect uh, your capability to get the electromagnetic communications you need. Uh, uh, you know, another case in point, uh, I, I spoke of going to a uh, standing army as opposed to a mobilization-based army. Well, that means we've really dried up our capabilities to rapidly expand if there were a reason why we would need to do so. So um, you're dead on uh, that you, you, you simply don't have enough resources within the system, nobody does, to protect yourself against every eventuality all the time simultaneously. You have to take risks and hope that the risks that you've taken are the ones that uh, are, are least capable of being exploited by the enemy. Yeah. I had an argument with the fellow who's the commander of CENTCOM right now, a Marine four-star, bright, terrific, courageous man, about that issue of vulnerability. Um, he believed that we had over-digitized and had it had become seductive to the point that commanders, and he had the 1st Marine Division at one point in the war, uh, were, were overly seduced by it and, and had forgotten all other skills th that if you dropped one nuclear device and the electromagnetic pulse wiped out all of our capability. Uh, being an infantryman, I accused him of being a Marine and <laughs> really wanting to go back to bayonets and so forth. But it, it, it's a wonderful argument, and it's a, it's a balancing act. Do you put most of your efforts into trying to harden these technologies and, and make them uh, as good as they can be, or do you do what a tanker would call um, degraded operation so that you have something? Mm -hmm. We don't teach uh, land navigation and map reading in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, right now. I served with uh, Ted Stroop here years ago at West Point and his entire sector of a department taught land navigation and map reading skills. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Uh, is that an untenable uh, frailty or not? I don't know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, actually, you bring up a really interesting point. This is something that's actually touched on the books and this is one of the problems of, of the transformation period. Was there, there was an awful lot of hubris about Perfect information, mm -hmm. all problem solved, helpless enemy. And, and, you know, um, and I think to the Army's credit, I think it's reflected in the book, the Army was not the worst offender of that, of, of the services. I would, I would say the Army was actually um, the most realistic in recognizing. And it's the particular nature of the land, <coughs> land warfare environment, which is by definition complex and nonlinear. So saying was every time you do something, it creates a problem. That's like saying, damn it, some days it rains and some days the sun shines. That's because weather patterns are complex and nonlinear, and so is ground warfare and always will be. So there is no, there is no, there, you're not gonna introduce a military capability that transforms land warfare from complex nonlinear activity into a linear process, right? 
Um, whereas w if, you're, if you're just concerned about sortie generation and, and steaming hours, you, you, mm -hmm. you can tend to think more linearly in, in, in terms of your activities. And then when you, you go to Congress, you can certainly kind of discuss those in, in, in different terms. Um, there, but there is no answer to your question, right? Because it's the, the nature of the environment. So it's, it's um, and, and I think, it, it, and, and, and as a criticism of the Army, I think it's fair to us, to us, we didn't, in, maybe I'm wrong, I don't remember investing a lot at the front end into the adversarial thinking. Um, we were just trying to get the damn thing to work, right? And, um, and yeah, and, and we always said, um, yeah, we know that people can jam this, we know this, everything. yeah, we know that, and we're, yeah, we understand that. Um, but, you know, in, in fairness to the Army, I think, too, I mean, and you didn't see this in any period of early transformation where people are sitting around saying, oh, yeah, but the vehicle can break down. You know, we're just trying to get the vehicle to work. Oh, yeah, we, we know that there are days that, that planes can't fly, but we just like to get the damn thing to land on the carrier first, right? And so I, I think it's in fairness, it's, it's, it's um, uh, you, you, at the front end of this, you do kind of have to focus on getting the damn thing to work. And, and yeah, the, the more you can bring the adversarial thinking and stuff into the front end of the process, obviously, the more robust and, uh, um, and resilient you're going to be, and that's great. But having said that, it's, it's very easy to say. It's almost impossible to do, particularly when you're building networks, because you can't test a network until you build it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because, of course, when you're in an environment with Congress, and, and, and General Hartzog saw us in the experimental process, when you have experimental failures, you know, people say, well, why am I spending money in this program? So it, it's a much simpler, easier thing to say than to do. But I, I don't mean to draw it on, but I, I will, I, I do think that, that the book is pretty clear in the fact that the Army really didn't, you know, jump on this advertising campaign and the notion that they were going to create some kind of transformation that was going to make perfect bloodless push-button warfare. And I think that's to the credit as to how well things actually did uh, pan out for them. Other questions, comments? Okay. If I could uh, presume on the panel again, I'm, to flip this around, uh, we sort of hinted at this, but you know, we talk about the successes of this period. You know, in our perfect hindsight, what were the mistakes or missed opportunities of '89 to 2005? Mm -hmm. You know, things that you know, General Hartzog, for example, would say. Oh, you know, if I had known, if I knew then, what I knew now. I would have done X instead of Y. Yeah. Well, I, um, we wrote 31 manuals, draft manuals of doctrine. We put 61 new pieces of equipment together in the division. I think we undershot on the doctrinal thing. We were not nearly as inventive, creative, or are um, ambitious with what we wrote, and we were hampered because we were all veterans at the time. I asked colonels to write doctrine, and so what I got was doctrine that was based off of the totality of that colonel's experience. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that we undershot it until we went out and tried it. So that's an important uh, lesson learned about live uh, experimentation. I, I will guarantee you that what works in the, um, I don't know, the gymnasium at Fort Drum will work differently in the Mojave Desert. It's a guaranteed. I guarantee you that what works well at the squad level with people that work with whatever it is for 10 months will work differently when it's generalized to 4,000 soldiers. I just will. I mean, what you don't know what you don't know until you try the thing. So if I had to do all this again, I would have been far more creative with the, the um, doctrinal side of it. Mm -hmm. The second thing is in experimentation, it's hard to figure out what causes the outcome. If you do a, a division at a time with 61 new weapon systems that range from uh, a small miniaturized battery to a... Um, Sentinel radar linked to a slew to Q Avenger trying to pick up enemy aircraft. Um, you, don't, you, you can grade it back to your metrics. You can say, I had 100 aircraft trying to come in here today. We picked up 96 of them. 
But you don't know whether that's uh, a result of the, uh, the radar, the training of the people who are running the radar, the efficiency of the gun, or the proficiency of the pilots that are flying your enemy uh, business. So you have to continuously fight to break down those metrics into smaller and smaller pieces to figure it out. And the last thing that I probably would have done differently was um, we were very reluctant to open this experimentation beyond a very small American part of the United States Army. And I, I lived in trouble all the time by inviting my counterparts from pick countries to this uh, stuff. But a lot of, this is a, the world is a small place. And even at that time, different countries had different capabilities that would have been very useful had we been able to uh, broaden our comfort zone to coalition and joint things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are a list of, I mean, I had a laundry list of things I would have done differently, but it's those sorts of things. Jim? Yeah, I used to beat the Army up because I was uh, at the front end of this, all the other services jumped on expeditionary capability, and the Army, more than any other service, jumped on digitization. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, I, and I used to beat the Army because I thought the Army got it wrong. Um, and then, you know, now that we're in war for 10 years, you know, obviously, you know, getting there first isn't as important as we all thought it was. Um, it, actually, I think the problem with the Army is that the second half of this period, we kind of jumped on the expeditionary bandwagon in, in some ways, and we shifted some of our emphasis and focus from digitization onto that. And, and I don't think that investment really paid out for us. I think strikers are, are a unique, interesting case. What makes the striker enormously valuable? Sure, maybe it's, it, it's not that it's rapidly deployable. It's just it happens to be a very robust capability, right? Um, so uh, the, the, the virtue of the sustained capability, you know, uh, the Army, the Army had a, I think the Army doesn't get enough credit for having it right and being the first service really to embrace digitization and, and networking in a way that, uh, the beyond the, the other services, and uh, and I, I think that I think they gave up on that too soon, and I, and I think I think the big turning point was Bosnia and Kosovo, where I think the army came out of it with black eyes, and and they wanted to kind of get back in the game, so they had a they they tried to play in the expeditionary way in a way that I think in some ways diverted maybe scarce resources and energy that maybe the army would have been better at just staying off on the path that, that General Sullivan and and, and uh, General Reimer were on, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, that sounds like a third book, actually, Jim. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. sounds, I'm getting nervous here, but uh, we are about out of time here. However, uh, I have, uh, I'm going to impose upon General Brown to stick around a little bit longer after we're done. Over in the corner, over on the side, I have uh, several copies of General Brown's book that I'm willing to make available to anyone in the audience who would like a copy, and General Brown has agreed to sign them. I think it's yeah, an important yeah. book that, that will indeed stand the test of time. So I hope you'll take advantage of this opportunity to pick up a, a very inexpensive, as in free, uh, <laughs> book and, uh, and get the author to sign it. And right now, I'd like a great round of applause for our panel. <laughs>